and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you, Roger, to our program. Thanks for being here. Thank you. I'm very honored to be here. Well, what a delight. Um, we want to hear how Roger Kellaway came to be one of the great jazz musicians of our time. How's that for an intro? <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Now, I understand you grew up in the Midwest as well, or East Coast, actually. East Coast, East Coast yeah. Massachusetts. East Coast. There's my, that's my home. Childhood home. And for those of you who, who can remember that far back, that is actually the blizzard of 47. Wow. So Wobbin, Massachusetts. Yes, Wobbin, not Woburn. Wobbin. Yeah. Chief, Chief Wobbin. Never met him. <laughs> Uh-oh. The guy I know, he's a, he's a really good friend of mine. <laughs> you had an ear for music as they... Oh! <laughs> Two ears. She's Marilyn said two ears for me. <laughs> but I understand your love for music started at a very young age. So tell us a little bit about the early days and what kind of household did you grow up in? Um, I I grew up in a household that was extremely supportive of of what I wanted to do and. Uh, I, my mother played a, a few standards, and my dad played the Bells of St. Mary, and, uh, and I figured out how to play that, and they asked me if I wanted to study piano. So when I was seven, I started studying in, in this lifetime. And I understand at a very young age, you had a sophisticated ear. You wanted to learn about the classics, and in fact, um, joined the jazz orchestra uh, in high school. We have a picture of you. Uh, playing the bass. Yeah, as Vinnie Morato. But Vinnie Morato was the, uh, the band director, and I, there were eight pianists that uh, when I went for the audition, so, and he said, how would you like to play one of those? I said, sure, and it was bass. And so I taught myself how to play bass, and four years later I played fourth bass in the Massachusetts All-State Symphony. Wow. How many instruments do you play? Well, I, piano and bass, really. You know, I play a little guitar, but I, I, little drums. I, I've been a rhythm section player all my life. Okay. And you went to the New England Conservatory, mm -hmm. graduating at age 19, is that right? I never graduated. I went for two years, and uh, I never got my degree until two years ago. They gave me my honorary doctorate. Yeah, bravo. And here we have you sitting at the piano, and I understand Bobby Hackett is... That's uh, actually 1959, and, and it is in Jordan Hall. It is Bobby Hackett, and, uh, and that's before the hall was refurbished. So right away, you started to be in demand, and I understand at a young age, you were one of the hottest pianos, pianists working in New York. And you ended up working and arranging uh, music for Bobby Darin. Is that right? Yeah, but you're, we're, you're, we're you're, you're jumping for, yes? really far ahead now. Because, Do you want to talk about well, I was before? I did the studios in New York sure. for, uh, for many years. And then in 1965, I came to this coast. <laughs> and I uh, started work, I worked for a year for Jackie Leonard. Mm -hmm. I was his stooge and piano player. <laughs> and then Bobby. Okay. So tell us about working with Bobby Darren. Bobby Darren. I meet Bobby Darren. Uh oh. There he is now. <laughs> <laughs> Bobby looks at me and he says, uh, and I've already got the gig, right? It's Friday. We're going to open on Tuesday. He says to me, somewhere in the files, there's a chart that goes, the shadow of your smile. Do, 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 do. 
I go, I search all the way through the files, I finally, I come back to him and I said, I'm sorry, Mr. Darren, there's no chart that goes, the shadow of your <laughs> smile, dee, dee, dee. He cuts me off and he says, but well, there will be by Tuesday, won't it? <laughs> so That you was my introduction to him. But I, I learned my stage theatrical timing from Jackie Leonard and Bobby Darren. How so? What, what was it about the timing that was so important? That you have to understand the energy between your performance at, and the audience. One of the things that you learn to play is the applause, for instance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You can't let the applause die before you start the next number. Mm -hmm. so, so that's how you, you, know, you, just, you keep things rolling. That's part of what Bobby taught me. And, and share with us the difference between arranging and composing. Composing is all about something original that you do from the beginning. Arranging has to do, or orchestration, has to do with something that already exists. For instance, when Bobby came to me and he said, we're going to do the music from Dr. Doolittle, nobody had done the music from Dr. Doolittle ex except for the, for the film. And he presented me with all the songs of Leslie Bricus. So I take the songs and I, I make arrangements of, of those songs. And because I'd been with Bobby for a year, I wrote the whole album for him. And they were all his kinds of ideas. And so at what point did you start composing yourself and start writing original music for yourself? Oh, very young. Very young. Yeah, I'd say 13 or, or so. What was your, at 13, and what kind of songs were you, were you writing jazz, were you writing uh, avant-garde music, were you writing cl classical music, what kind of music? I didn't know what avant-garde was at that point, uh, and uh, I, I was just, at 12, I was just crossing over from my classical studies to jazz. So I, w I was deep into uh, George Shearing and Billy Taylor and Oscar Peterson, who were my first three influences. But in the meantime, on my Victrola, which had a, uh, a timer on it so I could wake up to it, so I could wake up to uh, Stravinsky, or I could wake up to Bach, or I could wake up to Woody Herman. But, you know, I just had, to, I, there were a lot of things that interested me about it. Music. At age 13? Yes. Pretty impressive. So we have a picture of Bobby Hackett. Um, we have pictures throughout your whole career, Tim. We can't possibly talk about every single one. But as you evolved, you, you've been dubbed a, a musical chameleon. That yeah. there's so many different styles and so many different... How do different I get away from that one? <laughs> <laughs> you, do you musical find... Musical chameleon. <laughs> you don't like that, well, that I, phrase? I, I, what would you prefer being called? I don't know. I, 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 how do I relate to that? Okay, here's, here's the way I think of this. Everyone's life is a wheel. I just happen to have more spokes. <laughs> <laughs> and they're beautiful spokes. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> I don't, you so, yeah, I go in a lot of, uh, okay, chameleon. So among uh, your most outstanding contributions to the music world was the cello quart quartet. Mm -hmm. and, and I understand this was kind of a crossover uh, album or CD in that um, you were dubbed the, the father of new age music. Yeah, I actually was. <laughs> crossover music is better. Yeah. 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 Well, it, no, it just when you look back at, at, upon the upon the music. I was interested in doing uh, cello and piano music, but I wanted to do it my way. And uh, I was rehearsing with Edgar Luskarten, who had studied with Emmanuel Feuermann, and he had done a lot of studio work. So there were lots of jazz-influenced lines that I could write for him that he could play. Mm -hmm. And then this group came together because I wanted to have a group that was all wood. So it was cello, bass, piano, and marimba. And, and you produced two CDs, is that right? We did, yes. Uh -huh. We did two CDs. The second CD has, well, the second album has never come out on CD. Good old vinyl. Yeah. yeah. Well, they, we had 
24 and a half years of, of Come to the Meadow, which was one of the tunes on there, which was the theme of a, a PBS program. Fantastic. Now, while you were playing with the cello quartet, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, you started to experiment in the avant-garde, and you always had an affection for that. And now tell everybody a little bit about um, prepared piano and um, this unusual approach to music as, you know, for the most of us, we, we may not necessarily know what prepared piano well, is. Well, a prepared piano was created by, by John Cage. He had to, uh, he had to do a composition for, for a ballet and there was no room for an orchestra. So he had a piano and he started putting dowels and, and, uh, and all kinds of different materials in the piano. And with everything that you put in a string, it changes the vibration. So he really gave birth to an entire orchestra out of an acoustic piano. And you're actually playing the strings. We have a photograph of a peep prepared piano, your prepared well, I, piano. Well, there's, no, there's nothing about, there's nothing about this that, uh, that has to do with playing the strings. It's still playing the keyboard. But every single note that you play on the keyboard, because of what's inside the piano, will have a different timbre than, than the, it won't be like that. Mm -hmm. And I, I couldn't actually play what it would be like, but it, because it's an electronic piano. Yeah. So now, what drew you to this avant-garde approach to music? Uh, there, there are a couple of things. Uh, one of the things is my first wife hated it. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> now that's an interesting incentive to keep playing and, it. And she made some of the things about my life not very pleasant, so I, I just grew to love this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the other reason is I, I, I didn't realize this until probably in, in my mid-twenties. I, I finally realized that it was sonics and its sound that really delights me and the different things that you can do with sound. And when you spend your life in jazz, which is mostly playing with piano, bass, and drums, the, the, the sound spectrum from the mid to low register is always taken up. But when you're in the classical area, you have the entire genre to play. You can go top to bottom and you can play with everything. So that's what interested me. Well, you mentioned something very important which you shared with me in our oral history, which I thought was fascinating, is that that it is sound and all sound. And we saw a beautiful example of it with the feedback. You know, most of us were like, oh, feedback. Yeah. And you were, you know, your whole body language changed. Yeah. And <laughs> I'm ready to use it. No, it's, it's New York training. So it's people banging on pipes and uh, all, the, all the things that happen in clubs. And, you know, it's when it's during the winter. So you enjoy that, that tinkling and the clanking of the heater and... Uh, I do, yeah. Yeah, and most musicians would be... Not a for a long time, though. Really? Well, what brought you over to that side that allowed for, for you to riff off of those kind of sounds? Uh, actually, uh, being interested in John Cage mm -hmm. and, the, and the chance at aspects of, of life brought me into, I used to walk down the streets of New York and, and listen to the car horns and the bus horns and, and all of it at, as a composition instead of being angered mm -hmm. by, wow. or assaulted. So and when you moved to, to Ojai and it was very quiet, mm -hmm. did you have trouble sleeping and relaxing? No! <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> so on one spec end of the, on the opposite end of the spectrum, you wrote for the New York Ballet, the New York Philharmonic, the Los Angeles Philharmonic. I mean, all these wonderful people. Yeah. So, um, tell us what's happening in this photographs. What was this all about? Well, 
That's Balan Shivadze. Igorshka Balan Shivadze. Balan Shivadze. George Balanchine. I wrote a ballet in. Um, in 1970 for him. Uh, it was based on a couple of radio themes called Pan Am from Pan Am. So Pan Am Makes the Going Great was one of the themes. And I just used the initials P-A-M-T-G-G and he said, great, Pantagaga. I, I love it. Nobody else could pronounce it, but it became the Pan Am Ballet. Uh, Melziner sets and Irene Sharaf costumes and uh, and the third performance I got to conduct the New York City Ballet. Wow. So I, this, was, uh, this was an entree into a world of creativity that I didn't know anything about. And I gleaned the, the respect of, of actually being a composer in this world. It's, it's just so different. It's yeah. not film music. It's not. There's. There's nothing else like that. That uh, it's you. Uh, you just. It. You're revered. You're. You're given a space to, to do something that's that's really really incredible. So that was a, a great lesson for me. And to and to work with, Balanchine was unbelievable. You have written for television, and among your most famous work is the work you did with Norman Lear. Norman. Uh, and the, the ending theme song to All in the Family, which yeah. uh, oh, Carol O'Connor. That's, that's the uh, Robert Brown photo. Well, that's, that's this. Now, did you know Robert Brown prior to moving to Ojai? No. He had worked with Carol O'Connor. Yes. One of the artists that we've documented, lovely human yes. being. Well, we spent a lot of time together, and uh, I, I uh, you know, I miss, there's a lot of artists that I've worked with that I haven't spent a lot of time with. I miss the fact that I didn't do it very much with Carol. Uh -huh. We were in the studio. And we did make uh, an album for A&M, which I thought would be a gold album, at, until I realized that people actually didn't want to buy Carol O'Connor. They wanted to buy Archie Bunker. Oh. And he was so opposite of that persona. Yeah. Uh, so, and here you are recording that album, 200th no. episode well, of Well, no, All in the this, this isn't that album. That album was done with five pieces. But this, this album, uh, this uh, experience was the uh, Los Angeles Philharmonic, and we had them for seven hours for the 200th episode of All in the Family. Fantastic. You earned a, an Academy Award nomination for the work you did on A Star is Born. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that experience. That experience was so interesting because I don't know how many people remember Est. Oh. Ooh. I had just finished Est when I met Streisand. <laughs> and she said very early on to me, I'm really a shrink person. But we, we, we actually got along you know, pretty well together, even though after I wrote the first piece of music at 9 o'clock in the morning. She said, why'd you write that? <laughs> no idea. So I went home and I rewrote half of that and brought it all back. But the, here was the interesting thing about it. I had no budget. There was no, it was completely open-ended because it was Barbara. Mm -hmm. And Barbara could change her mind at any second. <laughs> and then I realized I could change my mind in any <laughs> second. <laughs> Well, it so obviously I, it, worked. We, 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 yeah. we all got together. You, I have uh, a note here. You, you wrote 26 film scores, is that right? Yeah, it's, yeah, somewhere around there. Maybe 29, actually. Pretty amazing. Well, I, 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 28. 
The 29th was uh, actually an orchestration for uh, Invictus for Clint Eastwood. How exciting, bravo. Um, and you had a rock and roll period, I understand. Um, <laughs> here you are at the yeah, LA Express. We all? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the backup band for Joni Mitchell? Yeah, 1974. That's pretty, uh, I bet those I are some good times. Huh? It, 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 it was an astounding time because I, I thought it was amazing of Joni to, to pick a band like this. I mean, yes, we could play her music, but we were all classically trained mm -hmm. and knew just a whole bunch more about music than, than she's ever known uh, in, in terms of knowledge. And yet she, she picked all of us. And we did 55 concerts together, and it was, it was just magical. Incredible. I do have a note here uh, on your website. You've worked with so many different types of musicians and some of the absolute greats. And to sum it up, and of course this isn't just only them, there are many more. Elvis to Ellington, Dizzy Gillespie to Yo-Yo Ma, Joni Mitchell to Mancini, Quincy Jones to Michael Tilson Thomas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a pretty nice group of people. Most people just want to know about Elvis. Well, <laughs> tell us about Elvis. <laughs> Where is he? <laughs> I, 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 I'm in Oslo, Norway, and I'm working on this gig for a, a singer. Mungni Wenzel is her name. And, and we go to the place where we're going to do the gig. And uh, I can't remember the bass player's name, but it was just bass, vocal, and piano. And up on the marquee, it says, Pianist for Elvis Presley. <laughs> <laughs> and I walk in, and it's a bar. There is no piano, but there's a pool table. <laughs> And they brought out an electric piano, and and we and I mean people expected to hear Elvis Presley songs. I don't know. We survived that night. I'm sure you dazzled them anyway. But uh, who haven't you worked with that you wish you had? It's Sock Perlman. I'd like to work with him. That that that's the first person that that comes to mind. I had always had a dream of of writing. A, a double cello concerto for Edgar Lusgarden and Rostropovich. Mm. That's, I mean, the cello is very, very deep in, in, in my life. I just, I love that sound. And for, just as an aside, what's really interesting about writing for the cello for a man is that the cello speaks in every register that I can sing in, in fact, more more than that. I mean, uh, Prokofiev wrote, uh, I think, four and a half octaves. But it's very interesting to sit at the piano and figure out a, a melody that you want to have, you know, be part of your composition and sing it, and and the cello can play it in that register. So. Such a beautiful instrument. Yes, and it's so soulful and and in many ways mournful, sad. Uh, sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, this image on your way to the Hollywood Bowl, you have your mom and dad there? Yeah. And obviously uh, Malibu. I kids, I, 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 to this day I look at that picture and I think, God, what, mom and dad, what were they possibly thinking? I'm sure you know, they're they, having they were a great about time. to get into a stretch limo to go to the Hollywood Bowl to, to see hear one play? of my pieces. Well, oh. no, I wasn't performing. It was uh, Free Flight. It was a, a piece I'd written for uh, Free Flight and the and the uh, Philharmonic. The L.A. Philharmonic, and your lovely wife Georgiana, mm -hmm. um, married over 50, 46 years. Is that right? This is our 47th year. Yeah. Amazing. And yeah. rather unusual in the well, music world. Yeah. Well, it what seems is it amazing. About, what is it about Georgiana? We've been together probably for the last 2,000 years. <laughs> Soulmate. And we're reminding ourselves of it this time. Yeah. 
beautiful. Uh, one of the most impressive statements you shared with me was your influences early on were older musicians, people uh, of another generation. Uh, and U.B. Blake, you shared the uh, story of U.B. Blake and, and how he influenced you. Share your thoughts about U.B. Blake and how these people helped mold you into the artist that you are today. The, the difference between the way I grew up and the way most of the younger people that I've met have grown up is that I was fortunate in my teenage years to work with people that were twice my age all the time. So it, as opposed to uh, younger people that I meet that are all hanging out together and they're all asking the same questions. Mm -hmm. There's no, and there may not be anybody there to answer the question. I always had those questions answered. All I had to do was open my ears and, and listen to what the messages of the older people in their playing and their experience had to give me. Mm -hmm. Very, very fortunate. And to recognize that at a young age, really fabulous. And what about these? That oh, you're is, smiling. Folks, that is Cab Calloway. Cab Calloway. And Benny Carter on the right, John Guerin in the middle, who was my drummer, trio drummer and pal for, for many 35 years. years. Yeah, that was at UCLA. It's great that you have so many of these historic photographs as well. Um, mm -hmm. Caterina Valente. Tell us about her and the project that you worked with um, in regards to Kurt Weill. Well, we did. I, I, I was commissioned to do a two-hour show to commemorate the 90th birthday of Kurt Weill, and it was to be done with the WDR Orchestra in Cologne. And what I added to the orchestra, uh, for those of you who are classical people, uh, I wanted a concertino and a ripieno, and my concertino, I, it, I wanted to I used two oboes and two celli, some of which you can see in the picture. And the main singer was Caterina Valente, who was somebody I'd known from the 60s. And uh, we just saw a few weeks ago. Her 80th birthday? Or yeah. Amazing. Yeah, she's, she's an amazing talent. So this project, um, you shared in your interview that you got inside Kurt's head, you, and you had great respect for him as a composer, and you even said that he's one of the greatest of all time. What is it about his music that resonated with you? Well, they, anybody that you're, you're working on arrangements, orchestrations, or you're thinking about a show, it, you must do the research. If I started reading biographies. I was already into his music. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I knew about uh, the violin concerto. I, I knew about things beyond uh, Mac the Knife and, uh, and, and, and those things. I'd, I, I just enjoyed, I, I enjoyed his concept of music and I don't know how to put this. I, I enjoyed his Jewishness. But in because, a beautiful because, way? Yes, but well, it, uh, kind of an odd way because it, he came from a village where Kristallnacht started, which was the beginning of the Holocaust. And, uh, I, it, and it, it, when you look at the, the early influences, he had cantors in his family. So you look at the early melodies that he wrote, and then you look at the difference in the melodies that he wrote when he came to America. And he was a, a very adaptable person, too. So that becomes a, 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 a curiosity mm -hmm. for me that, oh, look, he did that kind of melody, and then he did that kind of melody. And, it's, and he's influenced by different situations that, that he's in. Mm. And he's always interesting in, in terms of sound. Mm. A guy for your heart, really, yeah. you know, just kind of, yeah. yeah. So, uh, Zubin Mehta. Tuba Concerto, 1990. 
and Yo-Yo Ma. Tell us about working with Yo-Yo Ma and this whole experience. He's one of the sweetest people I've, I've ever met in my life. Such a great, he's such a great talent. And this, uh, we did an album in Paris together with Stefan Grappelli. But you know the thing that I, that I dearly love about Yo-Yo is that Yo-Yo did the Walton Cello Concerto, recorded the Walton Cello Concerto and the Britain Symphony for Cello and Orchestra. And after he did it, he actually called me and asked me what I thought of the recordings because he knew how much I loved the cello. Aww. And I and those are two of my very favorite pieces of all time and mm -hmm. he just did a magnificent job. Mm -hmm. What a talent. Mm -hmm. Now, I understand the first time he played jazz or recorded jazz, I should say, was with you. Yeah. That's <laughs> yeah. yeah, it happens all the time. <laughs> No, I, 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 I'll reflect one story here. Over <laughs> Yo-Yo, we'd spent, it, every day we spent in Paris, we spent at least 45 minutes on just Boeing. Explain what that is to the well, layperson. Well, if you're, if you're doing at every note on a separate bow, it's détaché. But if you're doing more notes on one bow, it could be a legato phrase. When he played legato, he rushed. Mm. No pun to Herman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm. So we, it, in order to get him closer to the beat, we had to get him to play détaché. Mm. It's, uh, it's inside stuff. Mm. Now, you were the musical di director for Kevin Spacey mm -hmm. and his project with Bobby Darin. Yeah, we spent four years together. Fantastic. Gosh, and now you're working on Visions of America. Yes. So tell us about your contribution to this epic journey you guys are on. Well, I, let me just say that aside from what it is I'm doing musically, I, I think because of Joe Soames' background, I've simply learned not just more about being, uh, I've, I've learned more about being an American, not just about America. And uh, so I, I feel more connected to the country than I ever have been. And that is what the creativity is coming out of. So it's, uh, it's, it's like, being genuine but being surprised by it because yeah I'm really in love with it and and it just strikes me that everybody involved in this project is so passionate about it and you have been just swimming in your studio uh, <coughs> working on pieces and um, as you call it the 45th bar <laughs> when you're buried? You've been talking to church, yeah, <laughs> yeah, how, yeah, whatever it is. How you could, any number works. But the creative process, be it a painter, sculptor, musician, mm. um, when you have that inspiration and it's all-consuming, <coughs> it takes over everything, you forget to eat, sleep, and you're just consumed. That's where masterpieces are born. Well. We hope so. <laughs> Do you know when you have a hit? Are we eating soon? Yes, very soon. <laughs> we only have a few images left. Uh, <laughs> you're switching the subject no, but on me. No, actually, we're talking about the same thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, do you know when you have a hit? No. Like, do you feel it inside you, or you get an inkling? No. You know, Joe was saying that and, and he was absolutely right on with it in talking about creativity. Mm -hmm. Your creativity has to come from you. And it can only be about you when you put it out there. It has to be about what you desire. And, and your feeling is that you want to have millions of people connect with you. 
and it, and it's always kind of a, a wait and see. Mm -hmm. I'd, I've never really felt competitive with, with other people that are in the industry, even though I am competitive, but uh, it, 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 generally I just want my million people. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe two or three. If you're too concerned about the success of a composition, does that impede your progress and your, uh, does that stifle your creativity? As you're writing the piece and yes. you're thinking about that? Yes. Doesn't work. Yes. Because it, do, it, doesn't, it doesn't honestly connect with your heart. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, during this project, you have been working on other projects, as I understand it. You mentioned Evictus. Um, mm -hmm. So you're, you're still working, you're still being honored. Here's a wonderful picture of you and Quincy Jones receiving your honorary doctorate degree. That was great. Oh, what a wonderful experience. So as you are working on this project, it seems to be all consuming, but you, you're kind of tap dancing many different projects. Uh, <laughs> not too many. <laughs> no, because I, I do like to eat. Yes. <laughs> oh, here we go. Here's a wonderful series of images of you in your studio. Um, I understand there's, you know, you have a very flamboyant way of uh, performing, uh -huh. uh, and you bang your elbow on the piano. You know, people think I play with my elbows. You know, I, I, you know, I go to I go to gigs and and somebody will say, "Gee, you're gonna play with your elbow tonight." And and, and here's the thing, in the second piano sonata of Charles Ives, there's, there's a board that, that he built that when you place it on the keys and you play other notes, certain harmonics come out that wouldn't come out if he hadn't done that. So I was thinking, gee, if, if that were the case, what would happen if I made uh, a sound that went from here to here, like... So that's what the intention is. If I'm doing a it's even on an F. It's the idea of of making a splash of of sound. That's you know, it's it's that. It's the forearm. It is it isn't the elbow and I I I <laughs> I've regretted the elbow twice. Hurt yourself? Yeah, yeah. I broken I, 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 it early on when I uh, played in short sleeves. You can break. <laughs> no, you can break the sack in, in your elbow. You don't want to do that. Well, steroids is what happens. What do you want to be remembered for? Oh well, the, the forearm's good. <laughs> I, I'd like to be remembered for creativity that touches people's hearts and uh, helps them to, uh, to feel good. I like to take people on a, on a journey and, uh, and most of the time I, I feel like they're, they're willing, we, we hook up and they're willing to go on the journey. And, I go, to, I go to some different places, but I always come home. <laughs> and the wow. people that go on those journeys with me always know I'll come home. <laughs> and that, incidentally, is because of the older people that were in my life when I was a teenager. They taught me about home. So as avant-garde as I can get, I always know when it's, what it's like to come home. When you are, are, are really curious, and, and I've been very, I've been like a five-year-old all my life, I'm very curious about all kinds of sound. So everybody's got something different to, to say, and, it, and you become very curious about those kinds of things. I mean, you run into John Cage, who's been such a controversial character all of his life, and people say, eh, it's awful, it's never music. Well, it isn't about music, it's about philosophy. 
the I Ching. It's about chance. It's about all the it, it, very, very interesting things, and all the prepared piano things that have, have come from from Cage. Everything is a different sonic adventure. So editing becomes my. That's the hard thing for me, because I go in so many different directions. I I don't look at a at, at a blank piece of music paper and not not have an idea. I usually have 10 ideas and then I spend days diamond setting to find out what the perfect what I think is the perfect idea.